Dear students, in the previous session, we have discussed about the concept of silkworm rearing, the process of silkworm rearing. We have also discussed about latex silkworm rearing. In this session, let us understand the different stages that are involved in the process of rearing, mounting and spinning of silkworm, harvesting methods of cocoon, raw silk testing and identification of silk waste. Young and adult silkworms behave differently during rearing and require different techniques for each instar, particularly in relation to leaf quality and environmental conditions. Early stage silkworm need closer care and attention as the resistance to disease is low. Both quantities of leaf fed and actual leaf quality requirements are different for each stage of larval development. The physical environment in which the larvae are rare is of great importance in achieving optimum growth. Temperature below 20 degrees centigrade at 4th instar and above 30 degrees centigrade at 5th instar destroy the physiological activities resulting in poor crops. At the later stage, it is necessary to control temperature and humidity by means of air circulation. So, the maintenance of correct physical environment is essential. So, we should have a knowledge on correct identification of life stages and life cycle of mulberry silkworm. Mulberry silkworm is a hollow metabolous insect and passes through four morphologically different stages in its life cycle like egg, larva, pupa and adult. The duration of each stage varies according to the race and according to the climatic conditions and the quality of food given. In univoltine and bivoltine races, egg period ranges from 11 to 14 days after break of diapers. Larval period ranges from 24 to 26 days. Pupal period ranges from 12 to 15 days and the adult lifespan is 6 to 10 days. Whereas the multivoltine race completes its life cycle early with the egg period of 9 to 12 days, larval period of 20 to 24 days, pupal period of 10 to 12 days and adult lifespan of 3 to 4 days. Now let us know about each of these stages in detail. Egg is the first life stage of life cycle. A female moth lays about 400 eggs in a single laying. The size, weight, shape and color of the egg as well as the number per laying vary among different races. The duration of life cycle spent in egg stage varies depending upon whether it is a hibernating or a non-hibernating egg. Hibernating eggs under natural conditions remain dormant for months together till the spring season in the next year. Diapause, that is a period of quiescence can be broken artificially by acid treatment. Non-hibernating eggs normally complete their embryonic development in 9 to 12 days and hatch out into larvae. The larvae of Bombyx mori like other Lepidopteran larvae are of erusiform or polypod type with abdominal prolex. The larva molds 3, 4 or 5 times and has 4, 5 and 6 larval instars. Instar means stage of insect between molds. The final larval instar after full growth empties its gut, stops feeding and spins the cocoon of silk around it. The last larval instar is 10 cm long. The pupal mold occurs within the cocoon spun by the final instar larva. Pupa can be seen only by cutting open the cocoon. Pupae are soft and white sooner after the mold but become hard and brown with the tanning of the punic pupal cuticle. The pupae is a non-motile and non-feeding stage. The larval organs are degenerated and adult organs are differentiated during this stage. Adult emerges from the pupa after 10 to 15 days. The adult moths have lost their flight due to several centuries of domestication. It doesn't feed during its short lifespan of 
3 to 6 days. The size of the moth is about 4 cm by 2 cm. The entire body and the wings are covered with epidermal scales. Now let us see the mounting of silkworm. The larva undergo molting 4 times during its life stage. The sign of molting is that the larvae keep their head in raised position. It is a very sensitive period lasting for 15 to 30 hours during which the worm does not feed but wriggles out of old skin and come out with a new and soft skin. Care during molting is stopping and resuming feeding at appropriate time that ensures uniformity in growth. So also keeping the bed dry and taking anti-muscadine measures during molting reduces the chance of contamination of diseases during this sensitive period. Silkworm takes 4 to 4 and a half days in 4th instar to settle for mold and nearly 30 to 36 hours in 4th mold. At the time of molting, the larvae require comparatively dry conditions. To achieve this, the bed should be spread to thin layer dust lime powder over the bed and increase aeration in the rearing house. This reduces the bed humidity and dries the leftover leaves quickly. As the worms show the signs of molting, the feeding quantity should be reduced. When 90 to 95 percent of the worms settle for mold, feeding should be stopped. Unsettled worms should be separated and rejected before dusting line. Resumption of feeding is done only after more than 95% of the worms have come out of mold. Tender leaf is given at the time of resumption after applying bed disinfectant and waiting for 30 minutes. For providing optimum spinning condition, the ripe worms are transferred to special devices called mountage. The process of transferring the ripe worms to the mountages or the cocoonages is called mounting. At the end of 15th star, the larvae reduce consuming leaf, release wet fecal matter, shrink in size, body becomes translucent and start crawling in the bed with raised head. These are the indications of the spinning larvae. Noticing these, the feeding quantity should be reduced and aeration should be increased. Once the spinning larvae appear in the bed, pick them by hand and put them on the mountages. The act of providing a suitable site for mature larvae to spin cocoons is known as mounting. Mounting of worms should not be delayed as the ripened worms will waste silk. For early and uniform spinning, apply Samburna, a plant-based steroid with anti journal properties in silkworm. Apply Samburna at the rate of 20 ml, which is dissolved in 4 liters of water, which can be used for 100 DFLs, that is disease-free layings, over the leaves for early and uniform spinning of cocoons. Mounting is the final and most important busy operation in silkworm rearing. The final installed larva, after attaining full growth, selects a suitable place, exudes silk through its spinner and spins a cocoon around itself and transforms into a pupa inside it. The pupa after metamorphosis develops into a moth, comes out by piercing open the cocoon. The aim of sericulture is to rear silkworms and provide them with optimum conditions so that they spin a good cocoon with high silk content and to harvest them before moth emergence. There are four methods of mounting. The first one is the hand picking method. This method has an advantage that only ripe worms will be picked. The worms will be uniformly distributed in the mountages and injured and diseased worms can be easily recognized and removed. In the second method called net method, the nets are spread over the rearing beds and ripe worms alone crawl on the nets and the nets along with the ripe worms are removed and shaken on the mountages. Handling is avoided in this method 
and it requires less labor. Next is the branch method. This is similar to knit method and here small branches are spread above the rearing bed. In shoot rearing, the early ripening larvae amounts to 10 to 20 percent are hand picked and the rest are shaken off this shoot and transferred to mountage. The last one is the free mounting method. This method is not popular in India. The early ripening larvae are hand picked but majority are allowed to crawl themselves onto the mountage which are placed above the rearing bed. Free mounting undoubtedly saves labor and causes minimum injury to the worms but has the disadvantage that uniform distribution is not achieved on the mountages. Now let us see about the population density in mounting. The ripe worm ordinarily requires an area for spinning its cocoon which is the square of its body length. Too wider spacing is uneconomical for the reasons like silkworm weighs too much silk for spinning the preliminary web, extra mountages and extra labor are required, too close spacing is also uneconomical and results in the formation of double cocoons and staining or soiling of the cocoons with excreta is very high. Overcrowding condition lead to a poor ventilation which winders the drying up of cocoons. As a result, more of damp and inferior cocoons are formed. With regard to precautions to be taken during mounting, only ripe worms should be mounted as all worms do not ripe uniformly. They must be picked and mounted. Temperature around 24 degrees centigrade is optimum for spinning. Violent fluctuations of temperature during spinning affect the uniformity of the filament spun and results in flaccid cocoon and a humidity range of 60 to 70 percent is ideal for spinning but by adequate ventilation extra moisture must be dried. Too high a dryness prevents the worms from spinning and the worms must not be disturbed during spinning as it causes suspension of spinning and breaking of thread. Spinning process takes place about 1 to 2 days in multivoltine races and 2 to 3 days in univoltine and bivoltine races. The fiber from the two silk glands come out through the spinneret independently and is called brins. The sericin of the two glands summons the two brins into a single thread called bave. We should take at most care during spinning. The quality of silk depends on the care taken at the time of spinning. Mature worms are sensitive to temperature, humidity, light at the time of spinning. The ripe worm requires space equal in area to the square of its body length for spinning. Proper spacing avoids wastage of silk for forming preliminary web that is the foundation layer and avoids double cocoons. To prevent staining of cocoons, keep mountage in an inclined position so that the urine may drop to the ground. Fluctuation of humidity causes abrupt thinning and thickening of the silk filament. A relative humidity of 60 to 70 percent is ideal for spinning. Provide proper ventilation and straw mats below the mountage to avoid excreta. Provide even and moderate lighting. Improper lighting like bright light or dark shadow causes crowding of larvae to shaded area leading to double cocoons. Remove dead worms and non-spinners on second day of spinning. To protect the silkworm from predatory ants, apply Malathion 5% dust or ant chalk piece at the base of the mountage stand. Let us learn about the harvesting of cocoon. The cocoon is made of a thread of raw silk from 300 to about 900 meters that is 1000 to 3000 feet long. The fibers are very fine and lustrous about 10 micrometers in diameter. About 2000 to 3000 cocoons are required to make a pound of silk that is approximately equal to 0.4 kg. At least 
70 million pounds of raw silk are produced each year requiring nearly 10 billion pounds of cocoons. The silkworms complete spinning in 2 to 3 days but the cocoons should not be harvested at this time as the worms inside are still in the pre-pupal stage. Harvesting should be done on the 5th day for multivoltage races and on 7th day for uni and bivoltage races. When the pupae are fully formed and hard, do not harvest when the pupa is in amber color. Dead and deceased worms on the mountages should be removed before harvest. The aim of silkworm rearing is to harvest the cocoons produced and sell them to the reeling agencies. What is the appropriate time of harvest of cocoons? Harvesting must be done after the hardening of the pupal cuticle and before the adult emergence. The tropical multivoltine and bivoltine races pupate on third and fourth day and temperate uni and bivoltines on fourth or fifth day of spinning. The recommended time of harvesting is fifth day of spinning for tropical races and seventh or eighth day for temperate races. Delay in harvesting beyond the recommended day may lead to the formation of pierced cocoons by the emergence of parasitic oozy fly maggots or by moth emergence. Too early harvesting leads to soiled cocoons due to putrefication of pupae injured by harvesting. How to do the harvesting of cocoons? Normally, cocoons are harvested by hands. Harvested cocoons are cleaned by removing any fecal pellets on them and sorted according to its sizes. Defective cocoons are separated. Okay, now we have harvested the cocoons. How to do transportation and marketing of cocoons? After harvesting, the cocoons should be cleaned by removing a litter. Double cocoons and flimsy cocoons are separated out and the cocoons transported in loosely filled gunny or cotton cloth bag during cooler hours of the day for marketing. Marketing of cocoons should be done on the 6th day for multivoltine and on 8th day for uni or bivoltine hybrids. If deflossing of cocoons are done, Reelers would pay a reasonably higher price for such a lot of cocoons. Can we do the reeling immediately after harvest? The seasoned or conditioned cocoons can be reeled immediately, but generally required to be stored for varying periods in reeling units. During this period of storage, they may be damaged by either the beetles, Dermastus ladius, or by fungal growth. If so, what are the precautions are to be taken against these pests? The cocoons must be dried completely. They must be stored in rooms with good ventilation so that humidity inside is maintained below 70% relative humidity. Ventilation also aids in removing traces of fumigants used in disinfecting the rooms. Cocoons must be inspected and turned frequently so that they have good aeration. Any stained or mold attacked cocoons must be carefully removed. Cocoon waste and reeling waste must not be stored in the same room or in a nearby place. We shall now learn about the testing of raw silk. The product of reeling operation is called raw silk. It is tested and graded according to the specification and accepted standards before marketing. This is done in special organizations popularly called silk conditioning or testing house. Here the silk is also conditioned that is dried by exposing the silk to hot air at a specified temperature. Silk testing ensures that the correct percentile weight of silk is found out. The transaction is fair without prejudice to the buyer or seller. The grading is done by an impartial organization. The reeler knows and makes an effort to, to satisfy the needs of the buyer. Categories of 
raw silk test. Visual tests are done to know the uniformity of color, luster and handling for a lot. In seri plane tests, the raw silk to be tested is mountain on a panel of a machine on a black background and examined under standard illumination. The appearance of filaments is compared with serigraphs that is the photographs of standard silk under similar conditions. These give you a rough estimate of evenness, cleanness, lousiness and neatness of the fiber. Cleanness is the defect of large knots on the thread. Lousiness is small white spots noted on silk fabric formed due to the splitting of fibers. Neatness refers to the small knots present on the silk thread. Second category of test is the mechanical test. Several mechanical tests are available to estimate the silk quality. They are winding, size test, weight test, cohesion test and tenacity and elongation test. Winding is done to estimate the strength of the filament when wound at a specific speed and a specific tension. This is done using the winding frame. Size test is done using a sizing reel. The deviation of the skein from standard skeins is tested. The machine for making the sizing of skein has a reel of 1.25 cm in circumference where 400 revolutions yield 450 meter of thread revolving at uniform speed of 300 rpm that is revolutions per minute provided with a dial showing the number of revolutions and equipped with an automatic stop motion to stop reel immediately in case the thread breaks or when the skin is complete. In weight test balances having a sensitivity of 5 milligram and a capacity of 50 gram or required to determine the total weight of sizing skeins in the scale for weighing the sizing. Skeins should be of quadrant or other suitable type. Next is the cohesion test. A Dupion cohesion tester is the standard testing equipment used. It consists of a framework designed for a continuous thread of raw silk to be placed in a zigzag manner between a set of 10 hooks on each side of the frame and a constant and uniform tension in such a way that the thread can be subjected to friction action at 20 different places simultaneously and the number of strokes automatically get reduced. Total load given for testing is 180 gram. Last test is the tenacity and elongation test. Tenacity is measured as the endurable weight of each denier. Elongation is the percentage ratio of the maximum extended thread of the original length. This is done using a serigraph. It has an automatic attachment which records simultaneously. The elongation of the clamps is 10 cm and the pulling speed of lower clamp is 15 cm per minute. What shall we do if there are any wastage of cocoons? Is there of any use of it? Let us see. All the cocoons in the lot cannot be reeled. The unreelable cocoons are the first type of waste called cocoon waste. The unreelable portion of the silk shell like floss and the peelable layer and wave waste, reeling waste also contribute for silk waste. Thread waste due to improper reeling resulting in frequent repair of the broken ends of the threads called winding waste. The bulk of the silk waste is utilized for the manufacture of spun silk. The silkworm pupae are very rich in protein and fat contents. They are used as manure and feed for cattle, fish and poultry. In some countries, oil is extracted from pupa by expulsion or by solvent extraction which can yield 22 to 28% by dry weight. The oil can be refined or used for industrial purposes. The residue after extraction is very high in proteins and vitamins. It can be deodorized and made fit for human consumption. In this session, we have learnt the life cycle of mulberry silk, mounting and spinning of silkworms, harvesting of cocoon and raw silkworm testing. We have also discussed about various silk waste.
Thank you.